Today, I want to continue our conversation of the Harlem Renaissance by discussing Langston Hughes. And I'll get to Hughes in just a minute, but you'll notice I also asked you to read this essay by W.E.B. Du Bois. And the part I want to draw your attention to is this part near the end when Du Bois writes about the necessity of art as propaganda. And I want to use that as a kind of framing device. And this is something you can use if you're interested, for example, in writing about Claude McKay or Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, any of these figures from the Harlem Renaissance, I would encourage you to spend a bit of time thinking about a figure like Du Bois and what he means by Art as propaganda, because I think his point basically is, well, there's so much literature and art and media, if we wanted to use that kind of term, there's so much literature, art and media that does the work of continuing to degrade black people. So we need to imagine or we need to envision that we, in effect, need to create art, literature, and media that functions as a kind of counter or, or it operates as this countervailing force against those negative representations of Black people. And I think in particular, what you might find with a figure like Linkston Hughes, whether he was deliberately or in perhaps an unintentional way referencing Du Bois's notion of art as propaganda, you see a lot of, of sympathy in particular for Black women and the plight of Black women, but I'll also say something about his poem, Theme for English B, because I think what you see here, again, it's not just poetry as propaganda, but it's it's also something, it's a, it's a poem that feels at times not too dissimilar from the sorts of texts that I asked you to read earlier in the semester, these, these encounters between indigenous native figures and white Europeans, but here it's, it's, it's twisted or it's turned a little bit because it's, it's these encounters between black people and white people in what has for so long, at least as, as Hughes was writing this, spaces that predominantly belonged to white people, spaces where black people were systematically excluded. But I wanted to say one final thing about this idea of propaganda, because often, especially today, when we think about and talk about propaganda, it has a rather unambiguous negative connotation. You would not, for example, want someone to accuse you of producing propaganda, but I would just encourage you to notice how in Du Bois's hands, this idea of propaganda doesn't necessarily have the same sort of negative connotation, or it doesn't have the same sorts of negative connotations. If anything, he's he's taking this idea or this notion of propaganda, and he turns it on its head by suggesting that, well, propaganda is, is the only thing, the only tool we have, again, to combat these forces that try to and that attempt to cast and characterize and describe black people in these racist, oversimplified ways. So again, one of the things that I think is just interesting about what Du Bois does here, especially reading it or or confronting this text as a 21st century reader, he's using and deploying a word like propaganda in ways that we don't often think about it. Again, propaganda, it's a word with so many negative connotations, but for someone like Du Bois, it is as if the propaganda of art and literature 
it's one of the few things that black people have as a way of, again, creating this image or creating this picture of them that is much fuller, that's more robust, that actively counters some of these racist, oversimplified stereotypes that, for a figure like Du Bois, appears far too often in literature, popular media, newspapers, etc. So, with that said, let us transition to Langston Hughes. So, what you see with someone like Hughes, and I think there are some thematic similarities between figures like Langston Hughes and Claude McKay, but I think you might see more structural and more formal similarities between someone like Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. They were actually quite good friends during the early 20th century because Hughes, he, he clearly, and I think you see this in the poetry I asked you to read, he certainly wants to promote this oral and this improvisational style and tradition. It feels a lot like jazz. And it's, again, the kind of, of, of thing or, or the sorts of aesthetics that we see in, at least for a figure like Hughes, in distinctly and decidedly black communities. Again, think back to Zora Neale Hurston's essay where she's describing this moment when she's she's in this cabaret and experiencing or having all of these feelings, but she looks at her white counterpart and there doesn't seem to be, he doesn't seem to share those feelings. So I think for Hughes, again, you can see this, this shared preoccupation. It's something we see with a figure like Zora Nell Hurston, the, the sorts of literary and aesthetic traditions that Black communities create. But what we also see with a figure like Hughes, and I mentioned this earlier, he he certainly encouraged artists to produce, quote, racial art. Again, here we perhaps see some agreement between a figure like Hughes and a figure like Du Bois, as I described him a moment ago when Du Bois wrote this essay about art needing to be propagandistic. But with someone like Hughes, there there seems to be this drive to challenge particular conventions. He wants to stage in his poetry these, these sorts of interventions between white and black figures. Again, I think we see this quite clearly in a poem like Theme for English B. But we also see, and I, I think here we can see distinct similarities between a figure like like Claude McKay, he's interested in antagonizing the voyeurism of modernism toward black people. Remember the last time we we talked about, or I may have mentioned this, that Hughes had, and if I didn't, my apologies, but I'll mention it now, Hughes had this particular line or this, this thing he said about, quote, the Negro being in vogue. This is, this is something Hughes said of the Harlem Renaissance. The Negro was in vogue. And I think part of what we see him wanting to do or trying to do with some of his poetry is to challenge some of the rather exploitative forms of voyeurism that came with with this flourishing of of black art, black literature, black music and again just think back to some of the poems and some of the discussions we had last week with a figure like Claude McKay but I think I want to start on 835 with his poem Mother to Son and I'll read directly from the text and and I probably won't have time to talk about all of the poems I asked you to read. If I haven't said this already, I, I wanted to say it now. Just because I'm asking you, and, and this is true in particular with the poets I ask you to read, I'm not, it's, it's extremely rare, that is, that I ask you to read everything that's in our textbook from, for example, a figure like Langston Hughes or Claude McKay. So if you uh, do the reading for a particular week, 
let us say, for example, you really like Linkston Hughes, but you you want to see or explore some of his poetry to see if there's perhaps a theme or a particular idea you could write about. I I don't have a problem with that. So so anything that's in the textbook, you may certainly use it. You may want to send me an email just to confirm, so I know that's what you want to do. But I just wanted to say that that option's available to you. But this is on page eight thirty five, and again, follow along with me. Well, son, I'll tell you. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's hard. Tax in it, and splinters, and boards torn up, and places with no carpet on the floor. Bare. But all the time, I was better climbing on, and reaching, landings, and turnings, corners, and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you set down on the steps cause you find, excuse me, cause you finds it's kinder hard. Don't you fall now, for eyes are still going, honey. Eyes are still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. So I think the first thing you might notice is just how this poem sounds, because if you uh, did a bit of compare and contrast work, it's quite clear that Hughes, his, his diction, which is to say his word choice, how his poetry sounds, it's distinctly different from how someone like Claude McKay might sound. It's, it's distinctly different from his diction. And again, I think you can see here clearly, because this is, this is a dramatic monologue. This mother, as the title suggests, speaks to her son. You can see Hughes desperately wanting to perhaps capture the sound, which is to say the ethos or the character, the personality of this individual. He's not perhaps adapting it or filtering it through a particular white prism, for example. He doesn't try to clean up this language to make it sound literary if we wanted to place language like that in quotation marks. Again, there's something about this. It almost feels like he's he's doing doing anthropological work. He's excavating to, to see what he can find, what sorts of remnants exist that might give his reader a sense of, of who these very real people are. And because of that, there's this palpable sense of the struggle this, this individual, this woman has experienced, and you can see how this idea of stairs works as a kind of controlling metaphor throughout the poem, because we're told in line two that she, quote, her life, she, she hasn't known crystal stairs. And, and I would encourage you to think about that symbolically, metaphorically, but the stairs she's experienced, they've, they've had tacks in them, splinters, they've been boarded up, there's no carpet, there's nothing comfortable. Again, you almost get this sense that if you wanted to think of these stairs as a metaphor, for her life, everything has been hard, uncomfortable. There's, there's been these, these forms of antagonism along the way. But the message, especially once we get to the end, the message is quite clear because I think what this poem is, among many things, is a celebration of the perseverance of black people, especially when you think about the forms of not just individual and particular racism they've experienced, but this larger systemic form of racism they've experienced, because this is what Hughes writes. I'll read it again. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you set down on the steps, cause you finds it's kinder hard. Don't you fall now, for eyes are still going, honey. Eyes are still climbing, and life for me ain't been no crystal stair. So this is not, and I think this is important too, this is not a naive poem. This is not a poem that, it's, it's not the kind of poem that pivots from some of those American dream ideals, just work hard and the world will reward you for your hard work. This is an incredibly honest and sober poem, but notice how Hughes still cuts it with a bit of 
optimism, though. And I think that that tension, it's constantly at play in so many of Hughes's poems. There is there is this sense that his poetry gives you this very real, very sober impression of what black people have experienced, but he doesn't want to just leave it at that, it seems. He he wants there to be this sense of optimism, this, this sense that perhaps things will improve. I don't know if I would even want to characterize it that way, but maybe more than anything, the need and the necessity for perseverance. And that's that's part of what I like about this poem, too. But I think you could also argue, and, and this is perhaps the final thing I'll say about the poem, this poem is, again, by using stairs as a kind of controlled metaphor, an extended metaphor throughout the poem, stairs function, it's a, it's a, again, an extended metaphor, this, this larger representation of just the struggle of black people in America. We get, it's, it's as if Hughes tells this story, this, this long story that has taken hundreds of years to transpire. Hughes tells us maybe not everything we need to know, but he, he covers so many of the bases in such a short poem, a poem that's around 20, maybe 21 lines. Everything, again, maybe not everything we need to know, but if, if we want just a primer for, for what this struggle has been, what this struggle has felt like, I think this poem gives us so much of, of again, the pain, the sense of objectification, all of the obstacles in the way, but also the optimism and the sense of perseverance that just seems to, to uh, persist. And in that way, again, I, I think Hughes is such an accomplished poet for those reasons because he's he's able to encapsulate this long history of oppression in a 20 or 21 line poem and that's obviously not where we should stop we should continue to uh, attempt to understand all of the particulars of this long struggle but again i think it's it's just quite remarkable how hughes successfully just encapsulates all of it in in this this compact little poem. So I I won't say a lot about the poem Mulatto. I think it's a beautiful poem. It's a difficult poem to read at times. It's quite harrowing, but I think this is I mentioned earlier for example that Hughes wants to stage these confrontations between white people and black people. And I think this is a great example of what that can look like. But I, I did want to say something about Song for a Dark Girl. This is this is a poem you could argue falls within, and I talked about this with McKay last week, it falls within this lynching poetry genre or this sub genre that was quite popular at the time. And again, I'll just, I'll read the poem and then offer a bit of commentary. Way down South in Dixie, break the heart of me. They hung my black young lover to a cross roads tree. Way down South in Dixie, bruised body high in air. I asked the white Lord Jesus, what was the use of prayer? Way down south in Dixie, break the heart of me. Love is a naked shadow on a gnarled and naked tree. So one of the things that I, I think is quite interesting about this poem, and we see this often in Hughes's work, how he appropriates perhaps language from different genres and different voices because this this opening line and he uses it to start each stanza way down south in Dixie and I think there's even a note in your book about this 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 is a line that sounds a lot like a minstrel song and if you're not familiar with the minstrel tradition I, I don't have time here to talk about it a lot, but I would encourage you, and if I can remember, I'll 
put some resources on D2L about minstrel shows because it's important to understand the, the horrors of the minstrel tradition. It really helps to inform, for example, why, my God, I believe the governor of Virginia, it was revealed or, or there was a, there was a picture in maybe one of his, one of his college yearbooks where he did blackface, that whole tradition of doing blackface, that, that, that's a reference back to these minstrel shows from the 19th and early 20th century. But yeah, if I can remember, I'll put some resources on D2L about minstrel shows. But here, I would encourage you to pause for a minute and think about why Hughes would start each stanza with this line, way down south in Dixie, because you can almost hear this line in a different context sounding like something of a celebration of the Confederacy. You can imagine it sounding like that in in a different context, but in Hughes's hands, it feels like a lament more than anything else. It doesn't sound celebratory. It sounds defeated or it sounds it sounds far less optimistic and joyful and just just utterly defeating way down south in Dixie. But something else we also see in this poem in the second stanza, and again, I believe I spoke about this last week, the ways these poems that fit within this genre attempt to ask these larger questions in particular about how how within a Christian context how a benevolent God could allow these kinds of horrors to happen. Because I think what we also see here, and this is something I spoke about when we read Robert Frost, what it means or what it meant for someone to encounter the chaos of modernity, of, of, of the early 20th century, of modernism. And you can see Hughes's speaker here grappling with and and not really having any any good answers or any sense of reconciliation when confronted by some of these more chaotic questions and and again just the chaos of the modern world the civil war at this point was many many decades in the past yet this kind of racial violence it just continues. It seems to persist. So we have a sense that this speaker, it's just a moment where they're asking, again, how, how, my God, how could a benevolent God exist? And yet these sorts of things continue to happen. And and this was this was something that happened during during this this modern moment or this 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 period of 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 modernism this challenging of traditions and religion certainly falls into that category the sorts of answers to those questions that satisfied people in the past they they clearly don't satisfy this speaker this speaker she's not satisfied with just trusting God or trusting the benevolence and the supremacy of God, she she seems to press against that idea, and she seems to arrive in a place with with very few, if any, good answers. There's no there's no consolation here whatsoever. The only thing it seems she's left to conclude is, well, maybe there isn't a benevolent God in the world. Maybe maybe the world is just all chaos, and maybe that's a better explanation for why these sorts of things happen than there's a benevolent God, and this is all part of God's plan. So I think from here, I want to transition and talk about theme for English B. Oh, but I but I did want to say one final thing. Again, song for a for a dark girl. Yet again, another poem where a black woman is is afforded 
an opportunity to to speak or 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 there's a kind of representation for a black woman here and and her her experiences the horrors that whomever this speaker is has has endured even though even though you could argue this is also a poem about this this lynched young man it's still more than anything a poem that that affords a black woman an opportunity to to speak she's given a kind of platform and once again i think you see something quite similar in so much of claude mckay's poetry at least the poetry that i asked you to read from last week so theme for english b it begins and ends on page 844 and even though it's a bit longer, I think I'll just go ahead and read it. So please follow along with me. And this is this is one of my favorite Langston Hughes poems. So yeah, follow along. The instructor said, go home and write a page tonight and let that page come out of you. Then it will be true. I wonder if it's that simple. I am 22, colored, born in Winston-Salem. I went to school there, then Durham, then here, to this college on the hill above Harlem. I am the only colored student in my class. The steps from the hill lead down into Harlem, through a park, then I cross St. Nicholas, 8th Avenue, 7th, and I come to the Y, the Harlem Branch Y, where I take the elevator up to my room, sit down, and write this page. It's not easy to know what is true for you or me at 22 my age, but I guess I'm what I feel and see and hear. Harlem, I hear you, hear you, hear me, we too. You, me, talk on this page. I hear New York too. Me? Who? Well, I like to eat, sleep, drink, and be in love. I like to work, read, learn, and understand life. I like a pipe for a Christmas present, or records, Bessie, Bop, or Bach. I guess being colored doesn't make me not like the same things other folks like, who are other races. So will my page be colored that I write? Being me, it will not be white. But it will be a part of you, instructor. You are white, yet a part of me, as I am a part of you. That's American. Sometimes perhaps you don't want to be a part of me, nor do I want to be a part of you. But we are. That's true. As I learn from you, I guess you learn from me, although you're older and white and somewhat more free. This is my page for English B. So I think it's unmistakable the influence that a writer like Walt Whitman has on someone like Langston Hughes. I spoke about this earlier in the semester. If you think about I, too, this poem he wrote in reference to, or, or perhaps even better, in response to Walt Whitman. And you see, again, there's, there's this Whitman-esque idea at play in this poem. In particular, that line... In the middle, hear you, hear me, we too, you, me, talk on this page. The, the sense, and I, I think we're also getting a sense of, of how art and poetry in this particular sense can work or function in a propagandistic way. Because on the page for a figure like Hughes, we, we see this, this melding or this blending of different races they just work and mingle and interact together on his page and he he makes reference to that a couple of times throughout the poem but what's also interesting but what's also interesting i would argue about this poem is how it all begins as an exploration of truth. Go back to the beginning of the poem. Go home and write a page tonight and let that page come out of you. Then it will be true. And you can see Hughes taking that single word, true, and attempting to understand, explore, and unpack what the truth is. What is the truth of his lived experience? Well, you'll notice it's not wholly bad or negative, nor is it wholly 
positive. It's it's this it's this confluence of the two working together. Again, this is another moment where we can see Hughes blending these these two separate or seemingly separate ideas together. And that gives us a sense or affords us an opportunity to understand just how important contradiction is to a figure like Hughes in the same way that contradiction is such an important idea and an important preoccupation for a writer like Whitman. But what I also just like about this poem is just how it sounds. There's a kind of rhythm to it that you don't see with figures like Claude McKay in particular. This line, and this is around line 25, or excuse me, this is around line 20. While I like to eat, sleep, drink, and be in love, I like to work, read, learn, and understand life. I like a pipe for a Christmas present or records, Bessie, Bop, or Bach, I guess being colored doesn't make me not like the same things other folks like who are other races. So will my page be colored that I write? Just, there's a kind of locomotion here. You'll notice the simplicity of the words. They're all just monosyllabic or single-syllable words, so many of them. That creates this sense, again, a kind of propulsion. You can almost get this picture of how Hughes's mind works as he composes this single sheet in response to this instructor's prompt. He's just moving through it so quickly. But I do like, again, I think there is this clear sense of progress or this, this hope for progress. Maybe this seems inevitable to a writer like Hughes, because if you look around line 30, and here, again, we can see him staging this confrontation between a white person and a black person. So, will my page be colored that I write? Being me, it will not be white, but it will be a part of you, instructor. He's addressing the instructor directly here. You are white, yet a part of me, as I am a part of you, that's American. So this feels, for a figure like Hughes, inevitable. That, that all parties or both parties will come to this realization. And I think for someone like Hughes, he's extremely interested in how, in particular, perhaps this white instructor is far more reticent to accept this idea than he seems to be. Because notice what Hughes writes after the line, that's American. Sometimes perhaps you don't want to be a part of me, nor do I want to be a part of you. But we are. That's true. So again, you can see this acknowledgement here as well. It's not that simple as, as I want this embrace to happen, but you're reluctant. Hughes, Hughes acknowledges quite clearly, well, maybe there's some reluctance on both sides here. But the final idea maybe worth thinking about, again, it gestures back to, to what the instructor's prompt says. And let that page come out of you, then it will be true which seems to suggest whatever his students write, whatever Hughes writes, well, it cannot be false because that would contradict the premise of the assignment. Therefore, this renders everything Hughes writes here the truth. And here at the end, I guess you learn from me, although you're older and white, and somewhat more free. Notice that's the idea Hughes, in effect, ends on. To be white is to be freer than to be black. And that is a truth that, over the course of American history, many, many white thinkers, writers, and influential figures have roundly rejected, or if they haven't rejected it, they found a way to explain it and compartmentalize it. But for a figure like Hughes, it's, it's just the truth. Not that it's right, not that it's the way things should be, but it's the way things are. 
So again, you can see because he responds to this prompt that in effect says, if you write it, it's true. He speaks to a kind of truth that perhaps figures like his instructor have never wanted to think about or embrace as the truth. Okay, I think that's where I'll stop. Again, Langston Hughes, he's an endlessly readable poet and thinker and writer, and I would encourage you to write about him if you want, if you have any questions or you need some help just maybe thinking about an essay for a writer like Langston Hughes. I think I've made a couple of suggestions in this lecture that might, that might move you along that path if you're interested in pursuing it. But until we speak next time, don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions. But until we speak next time, my name is Colin Cox, and this is Modern American Literature. Okay, have a good day.